Welcome to South Point Church Online, wherever you might be watching from today. And if this is your first time, we're so fired up that you joined us. My name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point Church. Hey, today, I wanna dive right in with a pretty embarrassing confession. And here's the confession, that most of my adult life, I've tried to fix the wrong problem. And me trying to fix this wrong problem has led to lots of failure, but even worse, tons of frustration that none of us would ever want to experience. You see, I bought into this myth that said it could deliver a promise that it could never ever follow through on. And here's the myth that I bought into. And it's this, that if I just worked hard enough, if I just did the right thing enough, and if I just worked hard enough and did the right thing consistently enough, that someday in my life, I would arrive at a place where I would no longer struggle or get stuck. That if I did those things, if I enoughed in my life that I would arrive at a place that was easy street and I can coast. And there were some key areas of my life where I've been working on this for a really long time, and, and they might be true for you, and I'm, I'm actually gonna put them up on the screen, it's this. I thought I'd arrive in my job. Again, if I, if I worked hard enough, if I was consistent enough, if I did the right thing, that someday I'd arrive at this place where I would no longer struggle in my job, and I would no longer get stuck. And I thought that was true with my money, and I thought it would be true in our marriage, and I thought it'd be true with my parenting, and I thought it'd be true in my friendships. I thought that if I tried hard enough and worked hard enough and did the right things and consistent, that someday in each one of these areas, I would arrive at this place where getting stuck and struggling would be a thing of the past, only to discover that no one, myself included, on this side of eternity ever arrives at a place fully where there isn't some struggle and some stuckness. And it leads me to ask you this question, is there anyone here today that is bought into the myth that if I did just enough, that maybe someday in areas that really matter to me, that you would arrive and be able to skip the struggle and skip the stuckness. And it leads us to a truth that all of us at some point in our life are gonna experience because I know I've experienced, and I'm gonna put it up on the screen. Having unfair expectations about getting stuck is often what keeps us stuck. You see, when I had the expectation based on my myth, if I just did enough, that I could arrive to easy street, when I would deal with struggle or I would deal with getting stuck, all of a sudden, I was hurt and angry. And here's what I discovered. In being hurt and angry, that was never helpful and it never really helped me get unstuck. Matter of fact, it often kept me stuck. So having the unfair expectation about getting stuck is often what kept me stuck. And I wonder, is that possibly true for you today as you're watching this. Now, I wanna quickly hit the pause button for anyone who's new and joining us today and do a quick recap of where we've been if you've missed anything. We're in the last message of our series called Unstuck. And there's been one big idea behind this whole series. It's a truth and a discovery we made back in week one. And we're gonna put it up on the screen, it's this, is that getting stuck is both normal and unavoidable in a busted world with flawed people. Listen, I'm flawed, you're flawed, we're all flawed. And since we're all flawed and we live in a busted and broken world, listen, getting stuck is normal and unavoidable. This truth at week one lets you and I know that arriving at a place where we never struggle or never get stuck again is absolutely a myth. It's impossible, right? which leads us to the discovery we made back in week one, which is this, without the skills to get unstuck. If getting stuck is normal and unavoidable, then we need the ability to get unstuck or we're unable to live the life that we want. And what's even worse, if we don't have the skills to get unstuck, we can't live the life that God has for us. Now, if you've missed any of these weeks, you can go on our YouTube channel. I encourage you to subscribe. We drop content uh, there all the time, right? Um, and then you can watch on demand. Now, back to our unfair expectation and myth problem that sets all of us up to stay stuck. I found out, at least for me, that the biggest obstacle to getting unstuck is my response of hurt and anger at being stuck in the first place. When I get stuck, I feel like life is being unfair. And I'll start making statements like this. I did my best, I gave it 100%, I did what was right, I worked so hard, I followed the rules. And then it changes to something like this, this is wrong, this is unfair, I don't deserve this. 
And if I'm really honest, sometimes I even say, God, why don't you like me? And then here's what happens. Because I feel like I'm in a place I don't deserve. Now I wanna stop. Did you pick that up? I had this false belief that because I did my part, I wouldn't and shouldn't get stuck. Does that sound familiar? And what ends up happening is my reactions are driven by hurt and anger. <laughs> and hurt and anger never help. They just kept me stuck. So buying into this idea that enough effort, we can arrive and avoid struggle and stuck is not only a myth, it's an unrealistic expectation that sets ourselves up for failure and frustration. You already know this. Arriving can't really be true because if everyone's flawed and the world is broken, then no matter how much we wish for it and no matter how hard we work, getting stuck is a lifelong part of the human experience. And just because we don't want something to be true doesn't mean it isn't true. And it leaves all of us asking a question today that we desperately need an answer to. And we're gonna put it on the screen. How do I let go of unfair expectations? I worked hard, I did the right thing, I kept doing it, right? Like how do we let go of that unfair expectation that lead to responses that keep us stuck? So that when we do struggle and when we do get stuck, we don't go out of hurt and anger, keep ourselves stuck in a place that we don't wanna be. Now here's why I love and follow Jesus. Did you know that Jesus actually addresses this very problem? And Jesus does it in such a clear and simple way that allows anyone to solve this problem. And the good news for you and I is that we're not alone. All of humanity has struggled with this concept of arriving at a place where we no longer struggle or get stuck. God knew this would be an issue for all of us. And in his goodness, God gives us the answer that we need. So let's take a look at the clear and simple truth that Jesus gives us. And we're gonna take a look at the eyewitness account of the Gospel of John, John 16, where Jesus destroys the myth that we can arrive at a place where we no longer struggle or get stuck. Let's take a look. He says, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You know that thing that happens when we struggle and we get stuck? It's usually not peace. It's usually hurt, anger, frustration, disappointment. But Jesus wants to give us something different. He says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. And then he says something so true, so simple, and so real. In this world, you will have trouble. If you're following along on your cell phone or laptop or on your TV, why don't you just type in the chat, trouble. If anyone tries to tell you that if you say yes to Jesus, that you will arrive at a place this side of eternity where you no longer struggle and you no longer have the opportunity to get stuck, they are lying or trying to sell you something. Because Jesus himself says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart. He says, there's good news. I have overcome the world. Well, if we'll never arrive at a place this side of eternity where we never stop struggling and never have the opportunity to maybe not get stuck, well, then what's the solution that is so easy and clear that anybody can do? Well, Jesus actually tells a group of religious people who ask him this very question. We find in the eyewitness account of the Gospel Luke, and it's Luke 17, and it says this. When he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come. So I wanna stop here and kind of break this down a little bit. So Jesus is doing amazing things. And the religious leaders of the day, they're not really impressed. They don't like Jesus because he loves all kinds of people. So they come up to Jesus and they ask him this question. And they say, when is the kingdom of God gonna come? And so I wanna break that word down, kingdom of God, because I realize today that some of you showed up and maybe you don't have faith or maybe you grew up in different faith and maybe you even went to church your whole life, but you never actually heard or understood what that phrase, the kingdom of God means. And when the Pharisees or the religious leaders use the kingdom of God, they're saying, for the world to work, the way that God intended it, right? I mean, listen, whether you showed up with no faith or different faith or some faith, all of us will agree that life is busted and broken, that kids in one part of the world shouldn't starve while kids in the other part of the world are obese because they have so much, that men and women shouldn't be sold into slavery because of the color of their skin or their ethnicity, right? That men and women and children shouldn't be objectified for sexual pleasure, that marriages shouldn't break apart and ruin families and that no parents should bury their kids. You know this and I know this, that the world doesn't work. And they're asking the question, when will the kingdom, when will the world work the way God intended it? And another way to say it is, when is God gonna be present and be with us again? 
When are we going to have the peace of God that we're right with him and right with each other and right with ourselves? And then when are we going to have the purpose of God? And so when we have God's presence with us, when we have the peace of God with us, and we have God's purpose, then everything works. He says, when is that going to happen? And what I love about this question is Jesus doesn't give a complicated answer. He doesn't try to avoid it. It says, he answered them, so let's keep going. The kingdom of God does not come with observation. Now, I stopped this little section right here because the religious leaders of the day, they were really good at following religious rituals. You see, they had this idea that if I did A and I did B, then God would do C. And Jesus is saying, listen, the kingdom of God doesn't come because you follow religious rituals. That's not what the kingdom of God. It doesn't come with your observation. Well, then what does the kingdom of God come with then? But Jesus isn't finished of saying what it isn't. He goes on to say this, nor will they say, here it is, or there it is. Now I wanna stop here. Jesus is literally telling the religious leaders that the kingdom of God is not a place on this side of eternity that you go to. It's not over there, it's not over here. He says, listen, it isn't some ritual, religious ritual that you do. It's not a location where you go find it and stand in it and, and everything's good. He says, no, no, no. And so they're going like, well, what is it? And then Jesus gives us such a clear and simple answer that any of us watching today can understand. And it comes in a simple sentence. And here's what Jesus tells us. I'm gonna put it up on the screen. For remember, we need to remember this. The kingdom of God is, maybe you just wanna type within, within you. You see, Jesus says the kingdom isn't about getting a place. It's about getting a place on the inside of you. Jesus begins to tell us that we should aim at living unstuck on the inside so that we will always be free no matter what happens on the outside. Jesus says, no, 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 the kingdom of God is something that happens on the very inside of you, that God's presence can come and live on the inside of you, that God's peace can come and live on the inside of you, that God's purposes can come and live on the inside of you. And when the kingdom of God lives on the inside of you, you are free no matter what stuck and what struggle happens on the outside. It isn't found here or there or through religious ritual. It is something that lives on the inside so that regardless of where we're at, we can stay or get unstuck. And what I love about this simple truth that Jesus teaches us, that this kingdom of God, the rule of God, God's presence, God's peace, and God's purpose, right? It isn't this place, it isn't religious ritual. He said it lives on the inside of us. There was this guy, his name was Paul. Now, Paul was not an original follower of Jesus. Matter of fact, he only began to follow Jesus after he encountered a risen Jesus. And Paul went around planting churches in all different parts of the world. And he planted a church in Rome. And this church in Rome was a lot like South Point. It was made up of some people who had no faith. It was made up of people who used to have different faith. And it was made up of people who grew up in kind of the Jewish faith. But they had all become followers of Jesus. And the apostle Paul says this truth that Jesus tells us that the kingdom lives within us. It's something that he wanted all of these people to remember. And matter of fact, we see how he tells them this should be lived out in this letter to Rome in Romans 14, 17. It says this, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking. You see, the apostle Paul is trying to remind those with no faith or different faith, those who grew up in the tradition, that it is not about the religious rituals. You know, are you allowed to have caffeine? Uh, can you have a cold beer every once in a while? Can you eat pizza or can you have fish or can you have milk? And he's saying, look, it isn't about that. He says, it's not about the things that you eat or drink. He said, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, that God's very presence would live on the inside. And we would see that through righteousness. That word righteousness is simply a way to say, rightly relate to God, we put God first, and we rightly relate to others. We love others the way Christ loved us, right? And then he says, peace. Peace that no matter what happens, because the tomb of Jesus is empty, there is nothing that can keep us from our destiny. We may be in pain and we may not like it, but our security is secure because the tomb is empty. And that we can have joy, that our circumstances aren't the measure of God's love. Jesus is paying our price on the cross means that you are loved and you have value. He begins to say it's not a matter of these rituals and, and religion, but of this righteousness of peace and joy of God's presence 
presence, peace, and purpose that lives on the inside. He literally takes that, what Jesus says, and says, that's what it's supposed to look like. And so if I was to sum up what Jesus is trying to tell us, it would be like this. I'm going to put it up on the screen. In life, don't try to arrive at a place. You know what? I kind of grasp this. I've been following Jesus for a long time. But if I'm really honest, I've aimed to fix the wrong problem. I've tried to arrive at a place where I would no longer struggle and would no longer get stuck. But that isn't what Jesus told me. Jesus said, in life, don't try to arrive at a place. Let a place come and live on the inside of you. See, Jesus tells us that life or the ability to get unstuck doesn't come from our surroundings. It comes from what happens on the inside. You know, I don't know much about fishing. I've never been a good fisherman. My daughter at one time asked me to take her fishing and we couldn't catch any fish and she was very disappointed. I do know that most fish, when you take them out of water, will suffocate. That's because their gills are meant to be open to receive oxygen in water. And you know, here's the thing. If we don't get heaven on the inside of us, we would never be able to survive the heaven on the outside of us. And that's Jesus' goal, is to get the heaven on the inside of us. So that no matter where we go, we bring a little piece of heaven with us. And that we'll never be able to fully experience heaven on the outside until something on the inside changes. And so the question is, is, well, if I showed up today and I'm kind of exploring faith, or if I showed up today and I didn't even like hear about Jesus and God, or maybe I've been going to church, but how do I actually invite the kingdom to live? How, how do I invite God's presence? How do I have God's peace? And how do I have God's purpose in my life? What does it look like for me to aim at the right thing? How do we do that? And you know what? I learned the hard way, but there are three things that allow God's kingdom to live on the inside of. Now, each one of these could be a whole sermon, and so I don't have enough time today to give you a whole sermon on each. I could try, but I promise you, I won't. Maybe you want to type, amen, Pastor Matt. Thank you. We appreciate that, right? But I do briefly want to give us three things, and we need all three of these things to experience the kingdom on the inside. And I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be a little piece of this that you go, oh, I like that. That makes sense. And then there's going to be a little piece that you probably go, oh, I don't know if I like that, but I understand why it's true. And here's the first thing that allows us to experience God's kingdom, God's presence, God's peace, and God's purpose on the inside. And I'm going to put it up on the screen. It's this, daily surrender. Did you notice I included the word daily? Now, I want to stop here for a second. I'm going to go a little old school and preach at you, right? Listen, have you ever had a good meal? Like, I'm talking about going to a burger joint or a seafood joint or a steak joint, or if you're vegan, going to a vegan place. I've been to all of those. Have you ever had a really good meal where you just go, man, that, that burger, that food, that dessert, it was awesome. Well, you didn't stop eating. You didn't go, you know what? I had the best meal ever. I'm going to stop eating from there. No, you, you eat another meal again. You, you eat daily, right? Have you ever had a good time, like gone on a date with your spouse and said, let's go do something and, and did something fun and, and had a memorable moment? You go, well, that was great. You know, we, we've been married. We had one good time together. Let's, let's never, ever have a good time together again. You go, no, we, we need to daily connect. Have you ever gone on a vacation with your family and had a really good time? You go, oh, well, let's never not go on vacations. No, no. Y you know, you, you do things on a regular basis. Daily surrender is necessary. Well, what does surrender mean? I choose the way of Jesus over my way. God holds first place in my life. Listen, you are loved. You are loved so much that God sent his one and only son. He broke heaven's bank. And no one put Jesus on the cross. He willingly went there to die and pay for my sins and your sins and the world's sins. And then he conquered hell and death. And the Bible tells us that he stands at the door of our life and the door of our heart and he knocks. But he will never force himself in. For us to have the kingdom to come live on the inside requires daily surrender. To choose the way of Jesus over my way. And so many times we want to end up in the right place but we want to take the wrong way to get there because it's our way. 
Uh, true story, I don't know if you know this. I, I used to coach AAU basketball um, for both or for eighth grade and then high school. And uh, I love basketball. And, and the one thing you'll know about sports is if, if you're a coach, it's probably because you weren't good enough to, to play. You, you need to be able to coach, right? So I love basketball, but I, I just was never talented enough to be good enough. But I loved basketball and I coached basketball. And I'll never forget this game that I had with a bunch of eighth graders. They were getting ready to go in ninth grade. The high school team was going to have a freshman team. This was a summer league that I was coaching. And we had this game against a, another eighth grade team. And it wasn't really going well for our team. Uh, they, they weren't really listening to all the coaching and what we had done in practice. They were taking poor shots. Their defense was, was not really good. Like, it just wasn't a really good game. And so I was on the sidelines, right, on the court, kind of trying to coach them and, and yelling at them and asking them to do this. And I said, hey, they, they changed your defense. Run, play, A. We had talked about this in practice. But did they do that? No. They did what they, you can type it in, what they wanted to. They did it their way. And it wasn't working. They weren't scoring. So finally, I got frustrated. And I called timeout. I just called timeout. I said, ref, timeout. I brought them over. And I said, listen, hey, do you guys like losing? And everyone looked at me like, no. I go, do you like winning? And they went, yes. I go, do you want to win? And they went, yes. I go, okay, let me tell you something. I'm the coach. I have a play. I know how to beat this defense. So remember in practice, and I used my little board and I showed them where to go. And I said, I promise that if you do what I said and you make a minimum of five passes and then hit the cutter, I get, I bet you'll get a clean shot and it should go in. Do you want to win and do you want to be successful? They said, yes. So the next time we got the ball, they went down the court. I said, remember, run the play. Five passes. And you know what happened? They ran the play the way we practice this, and guess what? Maybe you want to type in the chat. You already know what happened. They scored. And they ran down the court, and they were like smiling, high-fiving each other like they did something fancy. And then the next time they came down, they ran the same play against the same defense, and they scored again. And we eventually ended up scoring enough to win the game. And I'll never forget, a parent came up to me after the game and said, thanks so much for coaching our kids and helping them see that they have a lot to learn, and if they do the right things, they can win. Man, what a great analogy for life. We're trying to win at life, but we want to do it our way. And yet Jesus, who created life as our coach and our leader and our savior, he is the creator who creates guidelines and rules and commands, not to keep us from, from happiness, but to keep us from harm. And at some point, daily surrender is a part of what it means to follow Jesus. At some point for the kingdom to live on the inside, we must choose the way of Jesus over our way. Which leads to the second observation of how we get God's presence and God's peace and God's purpose, his kingdom on the inside of us. And it's this, daily connection. I make space to connect with God. Relationships need time together and communication. Listen, healthy relationships make getting together and talking and spending time a priority. That's what healthy relationships do. Because relationships, you know this, good, vibrant, living, healthy relationships require time together and communication, right? And so like, listen, we need to make space to connect to God because we need our daily connection. We need his presence in our life to heal us, to guide us, to support us, to, to point us in the right direction. We need him for so many things. We need that daily connection. And so here's my question, and here's something I've discovered. Because whenever I talk to people about, you know, spending time uh, daily with God, whether it's, you know, praying or maybe reading the Bible or hanging out with another, uh, you know, follower of Jesus to encourage each other, I usually get something like this. You know, Pastor Matt, that's great for a full-time pastor. You have all the time. I just don't have, you can type it in chat. What are you going to say? I don't have time. And then I just want to look at you. I just want to buckle up moments. Bing! Like, listen, this isn't to be mean. This is really to help move you forward. Listen, we all make time for what matters in our life. Can I get an amen? All of us make time for what matters in our life. Listen, if I was really honest, I bet if anyone's listening, I ask you this. Do you create space for your Netflix show? If you've been talking about Bridington or whatever that show is on Facebook, you're making time for your show. Do you make time for Spotify playlists? Do you make time to be on Instagram? Do you make time to be on TikTok? Do you make time to watch your favorite show? Like we all make time for what matters to us and what we spend our time and who we spend it with reveals our priorities. One time I went out to breakfast with a friend and when I got back, I ran into somebody else and they said, uh, well, you seem excited and fired up. I go, yeah, like I had breakfast with my friend this morning at six o'clock. And they looked at me and said, 6 a.m.? I go, yeah. 
I go, you had to probably get up early. I go, yeah, man, I got up really early, took a shower, drove there and had breakfast. And they looked at me and said, you're crazy. Why would you do that? And I go, well, my friend has six kids and he has two jobs. I have a couple of kids, I'm married, and leading the church is pretty pretty weighty responsibility. I'm pretty busy too, and so our schedule never aligned. And so we figured if our relationship really mattered, we needed to make time, so we got up really early. And I never regretted getting up early and hanging out with my friend because I enjoyed him, he enjoyed me, and you make time for what matters. By the way, I'm gonna give a shameless plug. Did you know that on every Monday, South Point, you can download YouVersion on your phone, and South Point has a devotional that takes like three minutes a day where you can like read a little bit of scripture, communicate with other followers of Jesus who attend South Point. It's a way that you can daily connect to God that's right on your phone, that comes right there. I encourage you to do it, to have God's presence, the kingdom come. We need daily surrender. We need daily connection. But there, there's a third piece and I'm gonna put it up on the screen, and it's this, daily purpose. I practice living in a way that loves my neighbor the way Christ loved me. All of us know most of what's broken in the world comes from selfishness. I don't know if you remember being a little kid. I remember being a little kid. When you're a little kid, you, you actually believe the world revolves around you because mom and dad made it revolve around you. You don't have kind of a, a, a view a holistic of the world and, and you just think, man, you're what matters in life. But as you move into adulthood, what you realize is that you are not the center of the universe and that to be human means you, you partner in a community with other people. You know, a couple of months ago, we experienced Christmas. Now, I love Christmas. Christmas is one of the favorite times of year for me. And you guys are like, it's February. Christmas is over. And I go, yeah, man, but it's only 10 months away. Get fired up. Like, I love Christmas. And one of the things that has changed significantly for me over Christmas is when I was younger and a little kid, and maybe even when I first got married, Christmas was mostly about getting what I wanted to. But something happened when I got married and something happened when I got kids. Christmas moved from about what I got to what I could give. To be honest with you, two of my favorite Christmases that I'll never forget were not about the presents that I got, but were about the presents that I gave. One was a little, like, it's a little wooden coat hanger, a uh, thing that you hang coats, right? It's like a little antique wooden thing. Uh, my wife saw it in the store. She said she liked it. I remembered it. I went back and bought it and gave it to her Christmas. She literally cried. She's like, you remembered and you bought it and you did it. Now, I, don't, I haven't been able to match that, but like I got it right once, right? I enjoyed giving something that she wanted. And the other one was my two daughters. When one Christmas, I got them both, one a cat and one a bird. I got, and just see their joy. Like I got to do something. And here's what you and I know to be true. In practice, living in a way that loves my neighbor the way Christ loved me. Not just the way I want to be loved, not just my definition of love, but Jesus says, a new command I give you. Love one another the way I've loved you. Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. Life isn't just about consuming. We were made for a purpose and to contribute. And that's something that we should execute daily every day. So if we want to have an unstuck from the inside so that we are free regardless of what happens on the outside, I want to sum up this message in two simple statements. And here's the first one. Jesus's promise for now isn't a place we arrive at. Listen, I love Jesus and I love God and I've been following him for a really long time. And you can work really hard and you can do the right thing and you can be consistent. But because I'm flawed and you're flawed and we live in a broken world, sometimes we'll struggle and sometimes we'll get stuck. Jesus's promise for now is not a place we arrive at, but a place that can live on the inside of us. You see, what I've discovered recently is that there is something God's presence and his peace, his purpose can live on the inside of me. And I can live free and unstuck on the inside so that no matter when I struggle, no matter what I get stuck, I get to bring a little piece of heaven with me everywhere I go. Could you imagine if every follower of Jesus who named the name of Jesus had God's kingdom living in their heart and everywhere they brought, they brought up there, down here. Imagine how different the world would be. People would be passionate about meeting this person named Jesus because we'd be turning the world upside down. Matter of fact, I would say it this way, and we're gonna put it up here. It's, when heaven lives on the inside of us, we are truly free regardless of what happens on the outside of us. 
And isn't that the goal? To have heaven come live on the inside of us? Because unless it's on the inside, the outside really won't matter. To have heaven come live on the inside of us and we'll be truly free regardless of what happens on the outside. And that is how we stay unstuck, no matter the struggle or the situations that could get us stuck. It's because there is something on the inside of us that has the power to conquer what is on the outside. I want to close with a true example that just happened to me uh, this past uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, my wife wanted to drive my car to go grocery shopping. It was cold and it was rainy. Uh, and I said, sure. So her and my daughter, they usually go together and they love it. It's a great mom and daughter time. And, and so I, I got a call um, like an hour, hour and a half into the experience. And I was like, hey, babe, what's up? And she said, hey, um, I came out from one of the stores and uh, there's a flat tire. And I go, okay. She goes, yeah, like somebody followed me and told me that like my tire was low. And I said, well, did you go take it to get it filled up? No, I just went to the store and I said, oh, okay. And so then I said, well, I tell you what, the store that you're at usually has a small automotive section. Once you go in there and get a can of Fix-A-Flat and like one of those little tire uh, pressure things that you can kind of plug into the cigarette thing or the, like the little UV thing and then like pump up the air in your tire. And she goes, oh, I'm sure the store doesn't sell that. I go, please, I I've seen it in there, just go. And so she called me back a little bit later. Yeah, they had one. And so we're pumping it up. And I go, great, babe, problem solved. Like we got that problem solved. So she went to the other store, tire still flat. Long story short, is that she got stuck on the side of the road. I had to go pick her up, transfer groceries. We had to get the car uh, on a kind of a rollback truck and get it to the shop and get two new tires. She got stuck. She didn't want to get stuck. We tried our best not to get stuck, but she got stuck. You know what I did that very day? That very day, I went onto the internet and I bought three cans of Fix-A-Flat for a tire and three of those pumps that you can stick in your car. And here's why I put them in the car. The fix-a-flat and the air pressure thing that could pump up the tire wouldn't keep them from getting stuck, but it would allow them to get unstuck long enough to get to a place where they would be safe and can get fixed. And see, that is like what Jesus promises us when the kingdom comes and live inside. Not that we'll never struggle and not that we'll never get stuck, but that we'll have what's on the inside to live an unstuck life. Because without the skills to get unstuck, none of us, myself included, will live the life that we want or the life that God has for us. Our hope and our prayer here at South Point is that all of us would allow God's presence and God's peace and God's purpose to not just know about it, but for it to live on the inside. And so here's, I have three challenges and they're simple. You can pick one of them or you can pick none of them. But here's my challenge. I want to ask some of you here today, you really don't practice daily surrender. You're just kind of living life and doing it your way. And I bet as I talked about daily surrender, there was probably an area of your life that you came to your mind, you go like, I, I know God wants me to do different. I want to ask this week, would you take a step of surrender and do it Jesus's way? Maybe for others of you, when it comes to daily connection, you would join this week's um, Uversion weekly devotion where you can connect with other people. It's so easy. You'll see it on our Facebook page. You can go into Uversion. It's free. You can download on your phone, on your laptop. It's so easy. Why wouldn't you do that? That is a challenge. For some of you that maybe you're, you know, you're a little bit along further on your journey with Jesus, maybe you would do something kind and gracious to someone that cannot pay you back to realize that life really isn't about what you get, but about bringing up there, down here. Because this is our hope and our prayer for all of us. Hey, let me pray. Heavenly Father, you frock. Thank you that Jesus tells us this truth that is so simple and easy, that arriving isn't the point. It's to have the kingdom of God arrive on the inside of us so that we are truly free regardless of what happens on the outside because someday we will truly be set free. God, you will come back and you'll make all things right. But until then, God, the solution is for the kingdom, for up there to come down there and live on the inside. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. And never forget, you matter deeply to God.